It now gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, Hugh Mackay, uh, who, who will no doubt be known to many of you uh, through his writing. Uh, Hugh is a renowned social researcher and the author of 16 books. And his new book, The Art of Belonging, was published earlier this year. And uh, congratulations to Hugh on uh, getting that out and is the subject of his presentation this morning. The Art of Belonging uh, is available to purchase, uh, and uh, we have a special offer for all of you, uh, and there will be more details of that later. In 2013, his book, The Good Life, was a bestseller, and his sixth novel, his sixth novel, Infidelity, also came out in this year, in, in that year, 2013. So I'm now very pleased to invite Hugh Mackay to speak on The Art of Belonging. Hugh. Thank you very much and good morning everybody. I'm sure those of you involved in the social sciences or even if you're just a human being uh, are sick and tired of being told what selfish creatures we all are. Uh, the biological sciences have been serving us this line for some time uh, that it's kind of our evolutionary duty to be driven by self-interest, to surrender ourselves to self-interest, and that even when we appear to do something altruistic, it's not really altruistic, uh, we're just doing that to make us feel good about ourselves or so we'll look good in the eyes of other people. Apparently, according to this view, evolution has decreed uh, that we should be ruthlessly competitive, uh, that we should be so intent on looking out for number one that we're driven by an aggressive, and even a violent uh, tendency uh, towards anyone who stands in our way. Well, just reflect on all that for a moment and look in the mental mirror and ask yourself if that sounds like a fair description of you. Uh, I'm sure if you're honest, you'll say, yes, I can detect echoes of all that in my own behaviour. There are times when I'm quite an ugly person. Uh, there are times when I can feel the competitive urge taking, taking me over. There are times when, in spite of my best intentions, I, I find myself behaving in a ruthlessly self-interested way. There is some truth in that view, but it's not the deepest truth about we human beings. The deeper and far sweeter truth about us is that by nature we are social creatures, uh, that it is our, of our essence to cooperate before we compete. There are good evolutionary reasons for that as well, but when we deny that our fundamental nature is social, we pay a very high price in our well-being, uh, in our emotional security, and in Mental Health Week, I should say, also, we put our mental health at risk. The truth about us is that we are not good at surviving in isolation. Yes, there are people who are good at surviving in isolation. There are such things as hermits. There are such things as isolates. There are people who hate the company of others and they are a tiny handful among the human race. The overwhelming majority of us find that we can't survive alone. Just look at how we live for a start. We live in cities and suburbs and towns and villages all over the world. We prefer to live in close proximity to each other for the excellent reason that we need communities to sustain us. That's what being a social creature means, that our natural habitat is the human family, being part of a community that will nurture and protect and sustain us. But one of the lovely things about human nature, the, the beautiful symmetry, if you like, of human nature, is that these communities that we need to nurture and sustain us themselves in turn need us to nurture and sustain them. 
Communities don't just happen and they don't automatically survive as history has told us. Uh, there are many, many examples, even today in Australia, of communities that are falling apart because we fail to recognise that the nurturing do doesn't just go in one direction. The community needs us at least as much as we need it. Now this all points to what I think of as the classic human quandary. Uh, and, and that is, how do we reconcile the inarguable truth that we are individuals with a unique sense of personal identity and we are members of families, we're members of neighbourhoods, we're members of workplace communities, associations, organisations, etc. In other words, we have a personal identity and we have a social identity and those two things in many ways are incompatible. They've become apparently even more incompatible in the modern era. When the ancient Greeks said, know thyself, they didn't mean embark on a lifelong quest for getting to know who you are, this, this neurotic obsession we have now with who am I. Uh, they had no concept of personal identity knowing who you are was knowing your place, knowing your civic role, knowing how you fitted into a community. One of my psychological heroes, Carl Rogers, the American psychotherapist, the founder of the School of Client-Centred Therapy, of course, uh, Rogers said at the end of his working life, he said that when any of his clients came to a full understanding of who they are, it was always to acknowledge that they are part of something, that they belong somewhere, that they fit into a circle, into a community, a family, a street, a suburb, an apartment block. Uh, there is some social context which they needed in order to make sense of who they are. But we struggle with this tension between the independent and the interdependent. There are lots of ways in which the human struggle is portrayed. Um, Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. Uh, we talk about the left brain, right brain uh, struggle, although uh, the neuroscientists are shedding a bit more light on that and making that distinction seem much more spurious than we used to think. Uh, but we talk about the masculinity and femininity tension within in all of us, or the rational and the emotional and so on. Well, all of those things may uh, help us to understand why we so often do feel conflicted and confused. But I think a very useful explanation of our confusion is this tension between I, the, the fact that I know I'm an independent individual with what I think of as my unique story, but I know that we belong to each other, that I can't easily separate myself from you. Uh, so yes, we do sometimes want to compete, uh, but we all know that the civil society we aspire to create and belong to demands that we cooperate. Uh, we know that in evolutionary terms, it's cooperation that has allowed us to survive and prosper as a species, and competition is a minor a part of that story. Uh, unless you have been in a coma, then in the last few weeks you've probably caught at least a glimpse of a football final being played somewhere in Australia. Uh, there's been a, a fair choice. Uh, a lot of analysis, of course, among social scientists of uh, the phenomenon of team sport, and we like talking about how it's a modern symbol of ancient, primitive uh, hunt, battle, etc. And you can do all that symbolic stuff. But the lovely thing that team sport teaches us as a kind of microcosm of how human society works is that you can't hope to compete unless you have first learned to cooperate. That success in team sport is all about setting aside your dreams of personal glory and deciding that you will be a member of a team. The concept of man of the match, for example, is perhaps one of the most ludicrous concepts we've uh, developed in contemporary culture, a, a lovely example of how we've been neglecting uh, 
our role as social beings and deciding that even in a team sport you can pluck someone out and say uh, he was man of the match. Well, our evolutionary imperative is to cooperate, to live harmoniously, to feel safe and secure within a community. And we know that, even though so much of our behaviour seems to deny it. One of the signs that we know it is the contemporary popular fantasy of the village. Notice how the word village has become such a popular word in contemporary uh, vocabulary. Everything's a village. Uh, you wouldn't imagine some kind of uh, housing development for retired people that wasn't called a retirement village uh, to try and take the edge off the fact that they're in God's waiting room. Uh, and uh, so we'll make you feel better by suggesting that this is a village. And we all know how charming a village is. Uh, a, a sterile, vast um, regional shopping mall will have its little village centre. It'll probably have a clock and a fountain or a potted plant or something, and this will be the village. Uh, High-rise apartment blocks will now be called, are being called, vertical villages, uh, as though, once again, we can pretend that it's not what it really is, but it's actually that thing you've got in your imagination as a sort of perfect place to resolve the tension between independence and interdependence, the village. The, the fantasy of the village is almost always rural. Uh, we imagine a rustic little hamlet somewhere, uh, a creek inevitably, kids catching tadpoles in the creek and racing billy carts down the street because there are no cars uh, and they're not bent over a screen in a semi-darkened room. Uh, everybody is nice, you leave your doors unlocked. Uh, there are probably people in this room who will tell you that when they were young they used to leave their doors unlocked. That's a very popular fantasy or nostalgia perhaps. Uh, there'll be a charming little one-teacher school presided over by an eccentric um, but uh, extraordinarily competent schoolmaster. We won't mention drought, uh, we won't mention grasshopper plagues in our fantasy, we won't mention snakes, uh, we won't mention the fact that mental illness is more prevalent in rural Australia than in urban Australia or that respiratory diseases are more common in the bush uh, than in the cities and suburbs uh, because the fantasy has us in its grip. Well, the good news, and it's occurred to many people, many people who live in the suburbs of our major cities, the good news is that anywhere can work like the village in your imagination. It's a central theme of, of my new book, The Art of Belonging, that we can develop. I mean, the, 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 the thing that seems magic about the concept of the village is that that's a place where we'll feel physically safe and emotionally secure and when you get that combination, physical safety, emotional security, that's when people say with a sigh of pleasure, I feel as if I belong here. Well, I remember a few years ago conducting some research uh, among a group of young mothers in the Sydney suburb of Mascot. Uh, those of you who are from Sydney will know Mascot well. Even if you're not from Sydney, you'll recognise where Mascot is. It's on the perimeter of Sydney Airport. Uh, and these people were living within sight of the airport, right under the flight path. And most of the conversation about what it's like to live in Mascot, the, the research was on why do you live where you live and how do you feel about it. Most of the conversation among these young mothers was about, was, was eulogising the life of Mascot, saying what a fantastic community they've discovered in Mascot, and why would you ever want to live anywhere <laughs> as the planes roared overhead and I could hardly hear what they were saying. What they were saying was, why would you want to live anywhere but here? Uh, the kids all play together and we all know each other and why would you want to live in the eastern suburbs, they said with disgust, or the North Shore, any of these allegedly de desirable places. Mascot is our heaven. And Mascot was their heaven because they did feel safe in both the physical and the emotional sense, they'd found each other. They'd found a place where the balance between their independence and their interdependence was being successfully struck. So there's no secret about the value to us in every way of living somewhere 
uh, where we feel as though we belong. Now, of course, we belong in many other places apart from the neighbourhoods where we live. We belong to cultural communities or intellectual communities or book clubs or choirs or workplace uh, communities. That's all true. But there is something uh, very special and potentially magical about the neighbourhood, about the place where we literally share common ground, where we breathe the same air, walk the same pavements, shop in the same shops, uh, and live cheek by jowl with these uh, apparently uh, uh, total strangers, at least when we begin. Who, who interviews the neighbours before they buy a house? or rent a house. Very few people. I have encountered a few people who've done exactly that, gone up and down the street, finding out uh, who lives there before they decided to buy a house. A very unusual, you might almost say eccentric, um, bit of behaviour. Most of us buy or rent the house and hope for the best. Uh, and what usually happens, and it happens all around Australia, indeed all around the world, what usually happens is that the neighbours start acting like neighbours. Sometimes they become friends, that's a separate question. Neighbours don't have to be friends, but neighbours who act like neighbours are the people who make us feel as if we belong here. In contemporary Australian society, more broadly contemporary Western society, there are enormous pressures working against the successful creation of these little villages in urban settings. The pressure on neighbourhoods not to work like communities is very intense. Uh, and most of the people in this room are very familiar with what those pressures are, but let me just remind you very quickly of the sort of items that I would put on the list of things, uh, ways in which our society has been undergoing fundamental changes, all of which move us away from the maintenance of stable and cohesive neighbourhoods. Uh, we should begin with our changing patterns of marriage and divorce. As a society, we are now more reluctant to marry than we've ever been. Uh, in fact, if you look at our marriage statistics and the uh, increasing age uh, of um, that, that, that people are when they marry, it's very tempting to say that marriage has gone out of fashion in Australia <clears throat> until you look at our uh, remarriage statistics and then you realise there's a hardcore group of people in the community who actually love getting married and <laughs> keep on doing it uh, on m multiple occasions. So it's a mixed picture. As, as with so many other markets, the marriage market is uh, rapidly dividing into the heavy users, the light users and the non-users in roughly equal proportions. Um, but to have moved as we have in the last 30 years from being one of the world's low divorce societies to one of the world's high divorce societies with Institute of Family Studies estimating about 35% of contemporary marriages will end in divorce, uh, that obviously has been a social revolution. Uh, it's, it's because we haven't had a history of being a high divorce society, we're still working out how to handle it. And obviously it's disruptive for couples who divorce. By the way, I'm not speaking against divorce. Um, I'm just observing what happens. It's disruptive for the couples uh, who divorce. Uh, it's disruptive for their extended families. It's disruptive for their friendship circles. And it's disruptive for the neighbours, uh, for the community that they belong to. The ripples go out. And of course, it's especially disruptive if kids are involved, uh, as they very often are. About one million uh, dependent children in Australia at the moment live with just one of their natural parents. And about half of them, uh, about half a million, are uh, involved in a regular migration, weekly or fortnightly, between the home of the custodial parent and the home of the non-custodial parent. Now, many families manage that beautifully and minimise the trauma for all concerned, but there is some trauma. Uh, but it's a dislocating effect when you're thinking about a local neighbourhood. It means that here, here are half a million kids around Australia involved in this mass migration regularly, being plucked out of one little, little community and uh, trying to integrate themselves into another uh, 
on a regular basis. We don't know what the long-term effects of that will be, but we know uh, that it often does cause pain and difficulty. And while we're on the subject of kids, uh, if you think of your fantasy of a village, there will always be kids. Uh, they'll be playing in the street. It would have been football any minute, it'll be cricket uh, playing in the street. Uh, well, that's true in, in, in suburban Australia over many years. Children have been the social lubricant. So many families say the kids got to know each other on the school bus or in the playground. Gradually, the families got to know each other. Uh, and that's how many of our connections within the neighbourhood occurred. Well, uh, it won't have escaped your attention that we are currently producing, relative to total population, we are currently producing the smallest generation of children Australia has ever produced. There is talk at the moment of a mini baby boom, and I don't mind people talking about a mini baby boom as long as they put heavy emphasis on the word mini. Uh, the mini baby boom is associated with uh, a, a little lift in the birth rate uh, from 1.7 babies per woman staggering up to roughly 1.8 babies per woman, where it stands at the moment. Replacement is 2.1 babies per woman, so it's not much of a boom, uh, still way below replacement level. And we know what a baby boom looks like because we had one in, 15, in the 15 years after the end of World War II when the birth rate was 3.6 babies per woman. That's a boom. Uh, we're currently below replacement and at half the level of, a, of an actual boom. So I'd be very careful about describing this as even a mini baby boom. But the implication, of course, is that the social lubricant children are in shorter supply than they've ever been. We have more childless households in Australia than we have ever had. And there are many social and cultural consequences of that, which are not the theme of, uh, of, of my presentation this morning, but just as a marginal note, it's worth observing that as a result of all this, we are becoming a less child-friendly society than we used to be. For example, children's wards in uh, major hospitals are being closed. There are still children's hospitals, of course, but in, uh, in our major hospitals, a child now goes back into an adult ward the way it used to be before a period when we took children a bit more seriously. Uh, we now have child-free restaurants. We have uh, uh, child-free resorts. If you're going on holidays, you have to check whether kids will be welcome. In fact, I saw a sign at, at driving in Western New South Wales. I saw a sign outside a motel recently that said, children and pets welcome. And I thought, this is a new category, children and pets. Uh, well, it's a symptom uh, of how we're changing as a result of a low, of a low birth rate. But the, but the primary effect that I want to talk about now, of course, is that when there are fewer children, there are fewer of these easy, spontaneous social connections that children make. Uh, and so we have to look for other lubricants uh, to ease the process of establishing neighbourhood contact. A favourite one, of course, uh, is dogs. Uh, the, the rise of pet ownership in Australia has been remarkable. You could, the graphs are almost uh, amusingly uh, correlated between declining birth rate and rising pet ownership, uh, which is presumably why so many dogs are given human names, because they are uh, obviously child substitutes. Uh, and people, do, in fact, in the, I've invented a little suburb in, in the new book called Southwood. So much of the social analysis is illustrated by stories from the life of Southwood and dogs play a bit of a part. There are, of course, dog walking parks and people say, this is how you get to know your neighbours by walking the dog. The only problem you have because of the way people now name their dogs is remembering whether Wendy is the dog or the lady who's walking the dog. Uh, so you just vaguely say, good morning, Wendy, and hope one of them will respond. <clears throat> uh, so there's another, uh, there's another factor working against uh, cohesion and stability in uh, communities, as is the rise of the two-income household. Uh, in in middle-class Australia, we've now decided that the appropriate standard of living can only be achieved with two incomes which means that virtually every household that contains two or more adults, uh, all those adults will be working. Uh, 
Uh, and that means that all those adults will be extraordinarily busy. They will be juggling uh, their working lives, their social lives, their domestic lives, and reporting that stress is the central feature of modern life. Uh, it's even changed the way we greet each other. We used to just say, how are you going? Now we say, how are you going? Busy? As though if you're not busy, you must be dead. Uh, you know, and how come you're here talking to me? Why aren't you off doing something productive? <laughs> busyness has become a sort of national obsession. Uh, well, all of that busyness, uh, all of the load that we're carrying in our quest for the economic uh, prosperity that we crave uh, has uh, a price to be paid in our social lives, in the life of the local neighbourhood and community because lack of time, lack of energy uh, can diminish uh, our, our level of engagement. <clears throat> the shrinking household is another uh, major factor to be, to be included in this picture. Uh, again, most of you are aware of the figures, I'm sure. Uh, the, the average Australian household today contains 2.5 people. The single largest category of household in Australia is the single person household. And that's also the most rapidly growing category projected by the ABS uh, to account for about 30% of all Australian households by the year 2026. Um, uh, if you put one person and two person households together, you've got already about 53% of Australian households accounted for. So if you live alone or just with one other person, then in terms of household demographics, you're mainstream. Uh, if you, here is a really odd case. If you live in a household with uh, a person you're married to and it's the only person you've ever been married to and you're living with three or more of your very own children and no one else's and they're all still with you under that roof, that's what we used to think of as the typical Australian household. That's now the eccentric fringe in terms of, uh, in terms of household composition. Well, what's the consequence of shrinking households? The short-term consequence uh, has been a lot of hand-wringing about the implication of this, uh, the, the rising problem of loneliness, people feeling some sense of social isolation, which might be interpreted as exclusion and might lead to feelings of alienation. But of course, it all depends uh, on the circumstances that have led people to be living alone. Uh, particularly on whether you're a voluntary or involuntary soloist. Uh, if it's involuntary, then loneliness is almost certainly a problem. If it's voluntary, loneliness may still sometimes be a problem, but the freedom, the sense of independence, uh, the ability to stay in your pyjamas all weekend and eat baked beans out of a tin uh, without anyone observing or criticising, uh, people report as a hugely liberating experience. Uh, but uh, when we have such a high proportion and growing proportion of households containing only one or two people, uh, this does change the way we live. I, my, my personal um, feeling about this is that it will probably turn out to be very good news for the life of the local neighbourhood because as herd animals, which we all are, we need herds. And if we don't live in a domestic herd in the way we used to, uh, typically five to seven people is the standard sort of human herd, uh, if we're living in a sub-herd household, uh, we'll, we'll need to find other herds. So things like book clubs, community choirs, uh, coffee shops, etc., all of these things are now exploding in direct response to the shrinking household. Uh, but still, uh, we're making the adjustment and there are still a lot of people at risk of social exclusion uh, because they uh, live alone or in a two-person household. The mobility of the population is another factor. On average, just like the Americans, Australians move house on average once every six years. Um, and there are plenty of people who've lived in the same house for 30 or 40 or 50 years. So that gives you some idea of how often some other people are moving house, but the average is once every six years. Obviously, an increasingly mobile population uh, does place some strain on the process of creating uh, neighbourhoods where we will feel as if we belong. I was talking about these matters at a, at a meeting in Geelong uh, a couple of days ago, 
and someone in the audience said, look, in our street, uh, the people who are moving in tend to be renters and we know they're on a 12 month lease. Is it worth bothering to get to know them? I hope you can guess what my answer was. Um, but yes, of course, renting is now among the under 30s. Oh, sorry, I'm in the 25 to 35 age group, uh, renters are now more common than buyers in the housing market. And that's often attributed to house prices, and that's obviously a factor. But there's another factor, I think, even more important than house prices, which is that age group. Uh, that is the very generation who, for all kinds of uh, social, cultural, economic, technological and other reasons have learned as a generation to keep their options open. They are the generation famous for their kind of transience, their sense of impermanence, their adaptability to constant change. Uh, the generation who are always asking what else is there. Um, well, a generation that feels like that certainly isn't going to rush into marriage and they're not isn't going to rush into parenthood and they're not uh, and they're also not going to rush into home ownership and taking on a mortgage so that's reflected in the in the figures um, but it does feed the, the help to drive the mobility of the population universal car ownership uh, is another factor in in the suburbs which used to work quite well uh, the, the, what we call the quarter acre block most of those blocks are less than quarter of an acre of course um, but it used to work quite well when there was a lot of footpath traffic. Now we come and go in our capsules uh, and we can go for weeks without actually sighting a, a neighbour. We might sight the neighbour's car and assume the neighbour is in it, um, but uh, the reduction of footpath traffic is a major factor as well, as is the one that I suppose you, you might have thought I'd put first on the list, the information technology revolution, which is making it easier and easier for us to maintain some kind of contact, some sense of even a community uh, in cyberspace uh, at the expense of time we might have spent uh, previously in face-to-face -face communication. We're still learning what the consequences of that will be. You can now find research to fit any argument you wish to make about the effects of the internet. Um, but broadly, we can say it's changing us. Uh, it's changing our, uh, our, our um, attitudes towards privacy. It's changing our attitudes towards identity. Multiple online identities are now uh, commonplace, particularly in the under 30 uh, heavy users of the internet, where up to 10 online identities is not uncommon. Um, uh, it, it's changing our view of what communication is. We're blurring the traditional distinction between data transfer and what we used to think of as communication, which involved tone of voice, rate of speech, posture, gestures, facial expression, all of those things, which as we know in the communication encounter, where there is real human presence, account generally, typically, for far more than 50% of the meaning that we attach to the exchange. But strip all that away and all you're left with uh, are the words or the symbols on the screen. Well, that's enough of that uh, lightning journey through how we've been changing as a society. But the implication of it uh, seems to me to be inescapable and that is that if we value our neighbourhoods, if we value the communities where we live, then obviously we're going to have to do correspondingly more work to nurture and sustain those communities. I said earlier that communities don't just happen and they don't necessarily survive. And when you have all those sort of pressures working against their survival, clearly if we believe in them, we will have to work harder. Not everyone believes in them. Uh, a prominent social analyst right here in Melbourne was recently quoted as saying, couldn't care less about the neighbours. Uh, all my socialising ha happens with my colleagues at work. Well, I was disappointed to hear a social analyst saying that uh, because it seems to me there is something special about the actual neighbourhood uh, where we live and our relationships with our neighbours require work, the same as every human relationship requires work. We say 
a marriage or a partnership won't survive if we don't work. Friendships won't survive if we don't put in the effort. Of course, that's all true. Well, neighbourhoods won't survive if we don't put in the effort as well. So what, what is it that makes a community function, particularly in the local neighbourhood uh, setting? Of course, there's a role for urban planning in this. Uh, every community needs places that make it easy, that facilitate social interaction. The essence of village life in our fantasy is uh, not that we can make appointments to see our neighbours for a cup of tea every on the first Thursday of every month uh, or invite them in twice a year for a barbecue, but that we're having incidental encounters, running into people uh, is what makes a neighbourhood function like a neighbourhood. And the way we manage those incidental encounters is the primary way in which we build what we now rather pompously call social capital. Uh, we didn't previously realise that saying good day to someone as you pass them in the street was building social capital, but it is. Uh, looks like rain, uh, said to a stranger at a bus stop as a friendly overture, build social capital. We, well, we need places where that will happen, um, places where we can congregate where these incidental encounters occur. Um, in, in the new book, I've got a, a chapter about uh, community hubs, and I mention a number of them, including, in fact, top of my list is local libraries. Uh, it, it won't have escaped your attention, I'm sure, that the library movement is undergoing a revolution, that libraries are less and less about reading and less and less about borrowing books, though those things still, of course, happen on a very large scale. More and more, it's, a, it's being a social hub, being a place where people come uh, for coffee, uh, for adult education classes, book clubs, discussion groups, author talks, all sorts of things that go on in local libraries, to a very significant extent replacing the role of the traditional parish church, which is in decline in most uh, parts of Australia. But churches are still community hubs for some people. Schools uh, are becoming community hubs for many communities. Shopping centres can do it. Uh, in, in the, the, the traditional strip shopping centre, which is undergoing a major revival, uh, is much better at doing it than the regional shopping mall, uh, where you're more preoccupied with trying to find your car again than you are about making eye contact with other people. Local parks, uh, all of these places work. But the key factor, of course, it, it, even in places that don't have sympathetic infrastructure, that don't have hubs uh, created to make this easy, uh, the key factor is our willingness to connect. Does it not strike you as tragic that in a city like Melbourne, and indeed all our cities, or uh, capital cities around Australia, and increasingly in regional uh, centres as well, people say, we don't know our neighbours, or we don't know our neighbours' names. And they say it, not with pride, of course, uh, they say it wistfully, or they say it as though there must be something wrong with their neighbours if we don't know them. Uh, well, we know how to know them. We just knock on the door and say, good day, I'm Hugh, I live next door, I thought we should know each other, see you later. Uh, I'm not casing your house for potential robbery, I'm just, I'm just making contact so that we'll know each other if we need to know each other uh, in the future. Our willingness uh, to connect, to engage, to associate with the people that we share neighbourhoods with, uh, to greet each other, to make eye contact, to look out for each other's well-being, to notice that someone who's normally in their garden in the morning isn't, hasn't been there for a few days to make sure they're okay. Uh, simply to acknowledge that we do belong to each other, that we are bound by our common humanity and our mutual need of community. Sadly, uh, the thing that stimulates the life of a neighbourhood is often a crisis. We know what happens when there's a flood or a fire uh, or a storm that blows people's roofs off uh, or an accident in the street, some, some catastrophe, crisis, trauma. What happens? Suddenly everyone's out acting like neighbours. And then very typically, they're subsequently saying, why didn't we meet each other before this happened? And they're maintaining contact uh, um, uh, ever more. Um, 
as I bring this little presentation to a close, I just want to read you a short story from the life of Southwood, uh, the, the fictional suburb. The, the stories are all true. Uh, the suburb is fictitious and the, and the, and the uh, characters in the stories, of course, are heavily disguised, but they've all come out of the years of uh, being a researcher and listening to people telling their stories. Uh, Southwood, like, like most large suburbs, is subdivided into little cultural pockets that have their own names. There is a slight rise. Southwood's a pretty formless kind of suburb, uh, just acres and acres of red roofs, no distinguishing features, no harbour, no river, uh, etc. There is a slight rise uh, at, at one end of Southwood, uh, which is known as Southwood Rise. And of course, the people who live on the rise feel superior and real estate prices are higher than they are elsewhere. Uh, there's Southwood Fields where the dairy farms used to be and Southwood Ponds where the settling ponds for the local sewerage works used to be uh, and so on. Uh, so this is a story uh, from Southwood Fields. Kendall Street in Southwood Fields has been a close community, uh, had been a close community in the 1990s, full of families with young children. As the children grew up and moved elsewhere, some of the residents sold the family home and moved to apartments or to smaller houses closer to the city. Some moved interstate to be closer to grandchildren. Others stayed to watch a new generation of families arrive and begin the cycle all over again. When a young Vietnamese couple, Jason Ng and his, heavenly, and his heavily pregnant wife, Victoria, moved into number eight, their next door neighbours on both sides welcomed them, but Victoria and Jason were both working and there had not been much time to connect with other people in the street before their baby was born. They'd both come to Australia as students and then been granted permanent residency, so they had no family in Australia. When their baby died in his cot, aged three months, the young couple felt their world had collapsed. They were devastated by shock and grief. They called their parents in Vietnam. Both mothers agreed to come out, though it would take a little time to organise. The appearance of the ambulance had triggered an immediate reaction in Kendall Street. The next door neighbours had insisted on bringing Victoria and Jason into their home for a cup of tea and something to eat. Those neighbours in turn had been phoned by various other people in the street inquiring what had happened. Over the following days, a steady stream of local people came to the house to introduce themselves and offer support. One did some shopping, one mowed the lawn, several people prepared simple meals and dropped them in ready for heating. At first, Victoria and Jason, inconsolable, didn't know whether they wanted to be left alone or embraced by these kindly strangers. But the trickle of visitors came anyway. No one stayed for long, but people felt it was important to make sure everything possible was being done for the grief-stricken couple. When it was decided that a service would be held in the funeral director's chapel, the street turned up and packed the place out. Weeks passed. Waves of grief still engulfed the young couple without warning, but they gradually embraced the idea that life could go on. They were comforted by the kindness of their neighbours. And when the two mothers finally arrived, they met several of the families in Kendall Street and were assured that Victoria and Jason would never feel alone or neglected here. Well, why wait for a tragedy? Why wait for a crisis? Uh, it's true that that brings out the best in us, typically, but in communities that are functioning properly, it's happening anyway. And when the crisis comes, we already know that the neighbours are people that we can depend on. The real test of our moral sensitivity, the test of our social maturity, and I'd suggest the test of our humanity is not how much time we spend with our friends, that's good. Uh, it's not how well we get on with our families, that's quite a challenge in some families. Uh, it's not how well we get on with like-minded colleagues that we share a workspace with. The real test of those things is how we deal with relationships with people we didn't choose to have relationships with. Uh, 
strangers who became neighbours. And that's why, to my mind, the neighbourhood uh, is potentially a special case, a special example of what I'm talking about. We didn't choose these people, yet they're the people that will test our ability uh, to coexist with, with other humans. You don't really know who you are until you know where you belong. Uh, and I want to conclude just by reading one short paragraph from the end of uh, the new book. Every community has its differences of opinion, its social divisions and its cultural tensions, which is simply to say that every community is both diverse and inescapably human. If you want to master the art of belonging, you'll need to accept the imperfections and deal with them. And the best way of dealing with them is to overlook them. There's a lot of tolerance, a lot of forgiveness in the art of belonging. Well, thank you for your attention. And <laughs> thank you. And we have some time for some questions, if anyone would like to, not necessarily questions, if you'd like to tell us a story about your neighbourhood or make a comment or ask a question, yes. Um, as an economics teacher, I recognise there's something that you possibly haven't addressed and that's our adherence to the free market. Mm. And I'd wonder if you'd comment on how whatever party we're looking at, it's not a matter of politics at... Um, certainly in the Western world, the, the uh, drug of the free market, I guess, influences a lot of what you've said today about our personal behaviour. And is that a cause for pessimism, optimism? Well, certainly, well, uh, uh, I'll, I'll nail my colours to the mast, not a cause for optimism, but not necessarily pessimism. Certainly, it's something we need to pay close attention to. Many people, as, as religious belief has declined in our community. The free market has been enshrined as the god uh, for many people and indeed many economists, but clearly not you. Um, but I think we have to look a little bit uh, carefully at how we're interpreting the free market in the modern world. Uh, Adam Smith is regarded as, uh, of course, the father of the free market. What people who admire uh, that concept and, and think of uh, think of Adam Smith as, as kind of the, the high priest of, uh, of the free market. What they overlook is that, that Adam Smith uh, was a moral philosopher before he was an economist and that his equally significant, in fact in many ways more significant book was A Theory of Moral Sentiments uh, and that his whole view of the free market was based on an underlying sense of the, of the essential cooperative nature of humans, that, that the free market would work. The, the invisible hand that Smith referred to was not just some kind of economic magic ab about how supply and demand would work itself out. The invisible hand that Smith was referring to was a sense of the, the moral sensitivity of the market, a sense of mutual respect, concern, cooperativeness within the market among people who were still competing in the market. Now, the, the current apostles of the free market completely overlook the philosophical underpinnings that Adam Smith uh, gave it when, when he espoused the concept. So it's run riot. Uh, it's produced a society gripped by consumerism uh, we've fallen for the idea that, that our worth uh, will be somehow measured by our wealth uh, or at least by possessions conspicuous enough to hint at wealth. Uh, in, in, in Australia in the last 20 years, this has plunged us into record levels of household debt uh, and, and many, many individuals and households have suffered a lot of difficulty servicing that debt. So uh, I, think, I think we've gone down completely the wrong path about all this. I'm not against the free market as long as we're true to its philosophical origins and recognise that a, that a market is only truly free if all parties to the market have absolutely equal access to all relevant information, 
Uh, whereas in the contemporary so-called free market, it is very often the case that the supplier uh, knows a great deal more about what's going on than the consumer does, uh, and that the market is characterised by a fundamentally cooperative um, ethos driven by a spirit of mutual respect. It's not too late. You know, it could, it, it, in some ways, it's not too late with politics. It is possible to imagine uh, the Australian political scene characterised by mutual respect. It would actually only take about two or three people to behave differently, and it would all change. Yes. Thank you, Jim. Uh, my name's Christy Anthony. What about density? Do cities have a role in the Southwood fantasy? <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, Southwood is a is a suburb of a of a major unnamed uh, Australian city. Um, density is, I mean, is a fascinating subject when we're talking about how communities function because communities function best when there's quite a bit of density, what we would normally call medium density. They function. They're harder to sustain when when we're strung out. Um, and so the, the classic Australian suburb, not just Australian, uh, in many parts of the world, which worked beautifully before the rise of the motor car, uh, doesn't work so well for the reasons I mentioned earlier. High-rise apartment blocks are appalling for developing a sense of neighbourhood and community. People who, who live in, those, um, in, in, in that kind of housing report almost universally, absolutely typically, that you av avoid eye contact in the lift and in the car park because when the density reaches a certain point, I don't know what the magic figure is, someone in the room may know, but when the density reaches a certain point, we become obsessed with privacy. Uh, it looks as though the best arrangement for us is something akin to the Victorian terrace uh, where houses are close to each other, perhaps even adjoining, but certainly very close. So uh, we have our privacy, but we have easy access to the life of the street and, and contact with neighbours is easy. So, so a bit of density is very good for us. And then there's the tipping point where it becomes even worse for us than being in more isolated settings. Yes, are there any other? Yes. Thank you very much, Hugh. That was really interesting. Um, my name's Elizabeth Coleman. Um, I was curious, and you made a comment there and, and about how saying hello to strangers builds social capital. Now, I can understand sort of, you know, like when you're saying, you know, saying hello to your neighbours builds social capital. But sort of this idea was, I thought I heard you say, was that sort of, you know, you're walking at, the, you're standing at the bus stop and you say hello. Yes. To somebody. Yes. It happens to be. Very like simple you. example, because of what it leads to. And because what it, I mean, we, we, it, there's a great deal of bleating going on at the moment about what's happening to Australian society. You know, what, what kind of nation are we? What sort of society are we, etc. cetera? And, and apart from voting differently at the next election, if, if that's an option, um, you can't do anything overnight about the overarching story or about the national scene and so on. All we can do is create where we are the sort of dynamics uh, that would be characteristic of the kind of society we would like to belong to. So you can affect the street, you can affect the suburb, you can decide to organise a street party or to participate in the local dramatic society or you know whatever else it might be that feeds, uh, that, that um, enriches the life of the local community. And tiny little gestures like saying hello are the first step. It's not that saying hello is magic of itself. It means that next time you see that person, you're not greeting a stranger, you're greeting someone you greeted last time. And soon, by soon I mean perhaps in six months, it may have even evolved in the Australian way into a conversation. We, we have become, particularly in our major cities, um, but, but with many glorious exceptions, I mean, many people like the ladies in Mascot that I mentioned will say that where they live, it works brilliantly. 
But in many cases, people do say, eye contact has gone. We're afraid of eye contact. I was talking recently uh, to a group of people about this and an, and an elderly uh, chap in the audience was just back from a holiday in Vietnam. And he said, walking through uh, the streets of, of Vietnam cities, everyone made eye contact with him and when he made eye contact, they all smiled. And then he came back to Melbourne and it, it didn't work. <laughs> I mean, even if you could manage eye contact, there was no, no sign of a smile. I remember in a research project a few years ago, listening to a woman who lived in Cabramatta in Sydney's uh, west, um, who had come, who'd migrated with her family from the country then known as Czechoslovakia. And she had two young daughters and she said, I'm trying to train my daughters to be completely Australian, you know, that, uh, they, they, I want them to talk to their grandmother back home, but I really want them to become young Australians. There's only one way, uh, in one respect in which I don't want them to be Australians. I, I'm encouraging them to smile and say hello to people in the street, and that is not Australian. <laughs> and I felt very sad when I heard her say that, but it's such an oft-repeated story. Stephen, yes. Uh, and link that to smaller families. But isn't that exactly the opposite of what Putnam is saying is happening in the USA? In his book, Bowling Alone, hmm. people used to belong to bowling leagues and to book Yes. Clubs, and it's decreasing. Is that a difference between Australia and the USA? I think it is, Stephen. It's an interesting, I mean, it's a fascinating book, but I, I, I'd, I'd never thought that that book could be read as if it was Australia. I think it, the, the American situation that he described, I assume accurately, uh, is a much more dire situation. And there are other aspects of American society that would shed a bit of light on that. I mean, the, the apparently unbridgeable gap between socioeconomic strata uh, gaps uh, in the US starting to happen here, but it certainly hasn't happened here. We would still broadly think of ourselves as a middle-class society, even though it's becoming less and less true. Um, but I think this... Uh, th th this phenomenon of community uh, group activity, um, I've mentioned book clubs, but choirs, community gardens, uh, all these things are absolutely exploding in Australia, which I see partly as a response to the shrinking household and partly as I hope, I may, this may be just wishful thinking, but I hope it's also a sign that the tide is turning, that we are acknowledging our, our character as social beings and realising we have to do something, uh, we have to do something about that. Now, the, the counter argument, of course, comes from service clubs, places like Rotary and Lions and hospital auxiliaries and so on, where people say it's getting harder to get people to join and volunteer and so on. And one of the things uh, about that, and in particular, harder to get younger people to come on board. And I think one of the reasons for that is that, I mean, if you sign up for Rotary, you've signed up for dinner every Wednesday night for the rest of your life with a group of blokes in most clubs. And that's not characteristic of a generation that's saying, let's keep our options open. You know, give us a project. Uh, let's join a book club that we can go to or not go to, or, you know, let's do some local uh, community service work. Great, give us a project, but don't sign, sign us up for life. So the idea of joining up is much less popular than it used to be, but participating, I think, is on the way back. Right, thank you. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Hugh. Um, I think there will be uh, a lot of people that wanted to ask questions, but he will be around for a while, won't you, Hugh? And uh, there'll be a chance to speak to him later. Just draw your attention to the slide uh, if anyone wants to read more. But I just point out how as always with, with Hugh's uh, presentations, so much research uh, and thought is worn so so lightly and entertainingly. And I have to say, one, one of the privileges of being having presidential role in, in this kind of event is that you do get to say a little bit yourself. Um, and I just must say here, just to tell you a story, I actually am probably one of your case studies. I live on the upper north shore of Sydney with, and I have a 
a dog called Teddy. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I was walking home from uh, the station uh, a couple of months ago, and I passed the, the first or the last, depending on which way you look at it, street in, in, in uh, house in my street. And the lady of the house, who I say good morning to, usually when she's putting her kids in the car, was in the garden with her dog, which I'd never seen before. And I thought she called the dog Teddy. And I said, oh, is, is, is he called Teddy? And she said, oh, no, no, Teddy lives down there. Um, she knew where Teddy lived. She didn't know where I lived. Had no, had no idea at all. Okay. Um, so... 